dressed in red. Oh, oh, it looked like a fan that blows his leg. And what do I see? Oh, the Holy Ghost are coming over me. If we talk about New Bern as a geographic site, we have to predate the term New Bern. Uh, uh, to where it was one of the capitals of the Tuscarora Confederacy. And the Tuscaroras, for all intents and purposes, were the most powerful people in Carolina, white, black, or Indian. They were the largest Indian tribe in the Carolinas. One of their capitals was at what is now New Bern, where the Trent and the Noose River come together. It's a natural port. This is the place that we call New Bern before it's ever New Bern. The early part of New Bern's history is marked by great tragedy. In a way, the early history of New Bern leading up to the Tuscarora War becomes this symbol of warfare and conflict between the European colonists and the Tuscarora nation. Those poor Palatine settlers had no idea that they were uh, uh, going to be uh, desecrating native land or that they were going to be considered invaders. New Bern has this notoriety of being the center of things. Of course, the English colonize it and it becomes a British customs port and one of the most important in the crown. I tell people that's why we are called Tar Heels today, is because the British especially wanted to colonize this area for the lonely pine trees, and the mouth of the Cape Fear River is where those logs and the rosin and the turpentine and the pitch and the tar was all floated down to this customs board. So it's a very significant place. Fast forward, what happens is, uh, it attracts and becomes a hub for slavery, and the crown begins to import and bring many Africans in that begin to outnumber the Europeans and the whites. Slavery is not a haphazard business. We're talking one of the largest, if not largest, business on earth. So you have the Lords of London and the Etnas, and these folks are putting their dollars insuring and investing in these, so they want to know if you're a planter in North Carolina, what do you need? These first Africans are brought from the coast of the Guinea or the Niger River Delta and present day the Gambia. And these folk were literally identified, captured, and brought over here to turpentine and hack in the lonely pine forest, and in large part because they were resistant to malaria. 
the people who are coming to these places, some people speak several languages over in Africa. And they come over with skills that are identified over there to be turned into slaves here and deprived of their humanity. The knowledge of who those folks are from where they came, New Bern is one of these places where it's transferred directly. A enslaved man named Peter escapes from a vessel in New Bern. And when his owner places a advertisement, a wanted ad advertisement offering a reward for his capture, he notes that Peter not only has African marks, but spoke English, Dutch, Spanish, and French. You know, a life history like Peter's opens this, you know, just this, we don't know every, very much about Peter, but we know that he obviously had this very broad experience that, that connecting, you know, continents. That's part of the advantage of New Bern is that the folks had that knowledge from the early beginning and has been passed down, even though they were forced into a state of slavery. So you have that element within the slavery community that doesn't exist within a slavery community out in Mississippi or a slavery community out in Arkansas or Texas because they don't have that direct transference from Africa. The knowledge of understanding of we didn't come from a void in Africa, but we came from Ghana or Senegal or a place that you know on the map and you know who your people were and what they did and how that transferred over here. Part of that knowledge is part of the fabric of Nuba. Then you have the element of white settlers coming in as indentured servants. Many, most of the whites are not slaveholders. They are indebted to merchants and to planters to get over here. If there's a boat of 100 indentured servants, there might be 95, 16 to 24 year old males. Maybe four or five, four women, let's say four women who are already betrothed to some land baron over here. These people are literally in the Turpentine orchards with the black people. They're working side by side. And there are no available white women, really. The rhetorical question is, do those young men remain chaste when there are Indian women and African women here? I say no. The historical evidence, DNA evidence suggests the same. So really for the first 100 years or so of New Bern history, the 1700s, there's this multi-ethnic mixing of Europeans, Africans, and Indians. And so you, that's a demographic that's particularly unique to Eastern North Carolina and New Bern and these places where the Tuscarora villages were in particular is where you find that. In the early colonial era, we were talking 1720s and 30s and 40s, many slaveholders would free African enslaved people. Over time, you get a very comparable population of free people of color in uh, New Bern, and also from people who are stemmed from Indian descendants and black and white mix, which was not illegal then. You get a, another population of what the old timers used to call free issue people or people who were never enslaved, neither their mother or father. This free people of color population could vote. Free African Americans had the right to vote from the revolutionary era until 1835 in North Carolina. But they still operated within this broader system of white supremacy, that, that was the, the rule of the day. 
And they helped look out for one another. They helped, in, in some cases, they helped their enslaved cousins and friends and neighbors to escape in the late 1700s. A woman, I believe her name was Anne Dig Diggis, you know, woke up one morning and someone had come and taken her three children and sold them back into slavery. That was in Craven County. She would never see them again. And, and that, was, that was the kind of reality that a free African-American simply had to live with. A free African-American never had what we would consider liberty. That demographic becomes a part of the fabric of New Bern in the early colonial era before the American Revolution. And as the time of the revolution comes along and someone like Governor Tryon and his palace is built, there's this certain spirit of freedom that you can almost call the American spirit of freedom that's there in New Bern uh, at the uh, early origins of American history. By the time the revolution comes along in 1775, you have the person who I say instigated the revolution more than anything, that's Governor Tryon, William Tryon. With his policy to hang and literally disembowel people who opposed the Stamp Act. His enforcement of that in Hillsboro, North Carolina, was what instigated the War of the Regulation and which precipitated the American Revolution. If you were on the streets of New Bern in 1780 or 1790, 1800, you would have seen a marvelously diverse peoples, all colors, all backgrounds. You would have seen a lot of free African Americans as well as enslaved and white. You would have heard many different accents and, and languages spoken. One commentator from that era said that he had never seen a place that looked so much like Port-au-Prince. In some ways it was a remote part of the you know, former British America uh, and, and uh, was far from big cities like New York and Philadelphia or Charleston, South Carolina. But in other ways, it was, it was a sophisticated, worldly place with ties all over, all over the Atlantic. The economy, particularly in the South, is evolving or devolving, how you might want to see it, is that you only attain a certain level of economy or the business titan, so to speak, only through slavery. At that time, slaveholders used to say that it, this, it was um, uh, God's uh, will that, that black people be enslaved. And here you have free African Americans who live in some cases in large houses in downtown New Bern and have literally brotherly relationships with some of the most powerful white men in town. This was something that North Carolina's 1835 Constitution stanched. It repressed not only the right of free African Americans to vote, but the right of African Americans to get together and pray in certain ways and to have basic liberties of travel and trade. It was the hammer coming the hammer coming down.
Very early in the war, the Union Army captures the Outer Banks and the towns, New Bern, Washington, Plymouth, that area. And it's just a small sliver. And as soon as that happens, enslaved people all over here, Raleigh, Durham, Goldsboro, Kinston, Halifax County, Bladen County, they head that way. They head by the hundreds, and then they head by the thousands and tens of thousands. And they, they come together more than any other place in and around New Bern. It is like a combination homecoming, spiritual revival, cultural renaissance. It's a giant family reunion. Enslave, enslaved people who have been sold in different parts of that area are coming back together there. It's like the 1960s in a way. I mean, it's like, you know, the music gets good. The, uh, you know, it, it's a literary moment. It's, it's, it's this, all these people who have, in their own different parts of Eastern North Carolina, have been organizing to survive, in some cases organizing to, to help others, you know, parts of the Underground Railroad. They've been, they've, some of them have been, have been hidden in the places like the Great Dismal Swamp and live, you know, they've escaped and they're living on their own. All of a sudden, those people are coming out. They're not waiting for anybody to come and rescue them. And once they're in New Bern, they immediately set about creating this new society. The first ones that arrive are the guerrillas and the rogues and the most rebellious, the ones who were doing things like operating out of swamps and making raids on plantations. Well, they're the first ones to go. But little grandmothers are traveling down the Noose River. I remember a slave named Juno she comes down the Noose River in a canoe traveling at night with her children. They're starting schools. They're starting churches, including some of the first African-American churches in the South. They do not trust the Union Army to look out for them. They begin operating in cooperation with the Union Army in many cases as spies and intelligence agents. Going back into other parts of Eastern North Carolina on intelligence gathering missions. They begin to organize politically, including some of the what I believe are the, f the first real civil rights organizations below the Mason-Dixon line in American history. They were called Equal Rights Leagues, and they're organized before the end of the Civil War, beginning in New Bern. They're also fighting against the Confederacy while struggling for their own dignity and rights against the Union Army in many cases. So in some ways they operate like a third force. They're not interested in this Lee versus Grant thing. They're not interested in Antietam and Cold Harbor. To them, all that matters here is if there's going to be this war and if Lincoln wants them to serve and fight more than 100,000 African Americans from the South will join the Union Army and Navy. 180,000 across the nation. Lincoln desperately needs them. And in New Bern, more than any place else in the nation, African Americans are insisting that they will be treated with dignity within the Union Army, that they will fight as full partners, and that they will turn the war into a war of African-American liberation. When one reads the Emancipation Proclamation, you almost wonder if President Lincoln had New Bern in his mind. New Bern was vital vital and it becomes, in my opinion, a new birthplace of freedom because you have this geographic area in deep eastern North Carolina vital to trade and commerce that is captured and then it is used per the Emancipation Proclamation to recruit colored troops, United States colored troops. 
The first Union Army general arrived in New Bern to recruit African American troops. Nobody was willing to join. The Lincoln administration had up to that point not supported African American citizenship or voting rights or anything, even for black men who served in the Army or Navy. So you could risk your life for the country, but you couldn't become a citizen. African Americans in New Bern were already politically sophisticated. They already had a good sense of how they wanted to be political actors, not just locally, but on a national stage. They realized that they could use the North need for them as soldiers as a bargaining chip. They could say, okay, well, we're, we're not just happy to be here. We're, we're fighting the Confederacy tooth and nail. But that doesn't mean we trust our future with you either. We will fight for you. We will fight with you if you do these things. You know, if this war becomes a war for African-American freedom, if you pay us the same as you do your white soldiers, you know, if you provide opportunities for education for our children. This was a shock to the Union leadership. They expected docility and they expected African-Americans, former slaves, not to have a sophisticated political agenda. And, uh, uh, they expected African Americans, you know, ensla you know the enslaved people of, of New Bern, just to be happy to be, have the, the opportunity to be in the Union Army. And they get to New Bern and that's not the case at all. They were ready. They had their own demands, their own political sophistication. It was a very sophisticated, when I, when I wrote The Fire of Freedom, I, I was constantly surprised by the sophistication of many of the African-American people in New Bern, including enslaved people before the war. I found an enslaved man in New Bern who, before the war, who was subscribing to the New York Post and the Congressional Record. That is not the view of slavery or the Civil War that I had been taught, you know, in school or in college. New Bern is the birthplace of freedom because this takes place in the South. We can see a thousand movies in glory about Boston, but that's, that's easy pie in Civil War talk. The rubber hits the road down South and New Bern is ground zero. To me, the Civil War is one of the most extraordinary moments in New Bern's history. And by itself, the events that happen in New Bern make New Bern, to me, one of the most important historical sites for the struggle for freedom anywhere in America. I love seeing the monuments to American freedom and liberty when I visit Washington, D.C. I know I'm biased because I'm from Craven County, but Washington, D.C. has nothing on, on New Bern, North Carolina. You know, it is, it is a wellspring of American freedom and the struggle for liberty that, that I think can be an inspiration to us all. And this is where the Union staked its claim, and that claim transforms over time and evolves into freedom for everyone. And it's not only freedom of the formerly enslaved people, it's important to note that we were freed from the scourge of slavery. Everyone, you for an example, couldn't buy collard greens from me as a black farmer if I traveled from Craven County to Jones County. It, it was a slave code, couldn't do it. I could not obviously talk to you and look at you in the eyes as a slave code, couldn't do it. These are the types of things that I'm sure many white people felt uneasy enforcing, but they were mandated to enforce those or they were subject 
to the whims and to the punishment and to the slave codes also. So the 13th Amendment frees all of us from the scourge of slavery.